Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. Lord, here we are, a family of faithful gathered together in great love for you and for each other. Bless us with strength and character as Christians to go and share your love and our love for you with others that we meet. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I invite you to join me in our call to worship that you will find printed in your bulletin. Join us as we prepare for worship. As we gather together as the body of Christ, let us worship God as children. Let us worship God as youth. Let us worship God as adults. Let us worship God as elders. Let the body of Christ sing praises to God. Let's stand together as we sing hymn number 87, Come Christians Join to Sing, hymn number 87. bought a special friend with me today. What is that? A light bulb. Well, this is Larry the light bulb. Is Larry happy or is he sad? Larry's very, very sad. And he's sad because he's learned that he's going to be phased out. They're not going to make any more Larry light bulbs. They say that he produces too much carbon and it's not good for our atmosphere. So Larry's going to be replaced with a different looking light bulb like that. Have you seen one like that yet? That's going to be our new light bulb. But you know, everything changes, doesn't it? Everything changes. Well, think about the seasons. We have spring and summer 
and winter and fall. Oh, think about the trees. What happens to the trees in the springtime? The sap comes up in the trees and the leaves pop out. They make a shade for summertime. And then the fall comes along and what happens to the leaves on the trees? They fall down to the ground. I've changed too. And you know I used to be a little child like you. And then I grew tall. And then I grew fat. And I used to have brown hair like some of you. And now it's just as gray as it can be. And a little bit stubborn. So everything changes. So how old do you think you have to be to be a child? Seven. Five. Four. Well, I want you to look around a minute. Do you see any children out there? Turn around, look and see. You see any children out there? Not too many. But God has a different way of looking at children. Yet God tells us in his Bible that as long as we follow his teaching and ask his spirit to appear in our hearts, that we will always be his child, even till we are old hundred years old forever and ever and ever will be God's children and I want you to remember that I think that's a very good thing and something we need to pray about but when we get through with the prayer I don't want you to leave because I got something for you okay let's bow our heads Lord we thank you for loving us we thank you for being your children forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Please open your hearts and your minds as we listen to the word of God from Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May we pray. Our Father, such a beautiful day that you've given us to come to worship. Not only a beautiful day, but a beautiful sanctuary that we can gather together to pray one for another, to seek you for strength. This is a very special day in the life of our church when we recognize our senior citizens. A lot of senior citizens are with us today. They're still serving, teaching, singing in the choir. We have senior citizens who help on Wednesday night in the kitchen, help them clean up after our meal on Wednesday night, still being useful in the service for Christ. We have a lot of seniors who are not with us today who would love to be here those in the rest home, those who are homebound, so many of them who have given their lives in service for you here in this church. May the younger generation not forget those who have laid the foundation and who have been the cornerstone of First Baptist Church for many years. Let us thank them for their service and many seniors think they are unuseful when they become of age. But help us all to realize that as long as we can live, as long as we can draw breath, as long as we can speak, we still have a purpose in the life and ministry of First Baptist Church or wherever we may be. So we thank you for their service. We thank for all who are here today who participate in the services of our church. We pray for those who are sick and afflicted in the home, in the rest homes. Lord, that you would touch their bodies and let them know that we care about them, that we love them, and that we would love for them to be here. May we as Christians and First Baptist members continue to reach out to those who are lost, those who need our help, those who need our prayers. That your name may be honored and glorified through this church and through each member. These blessings we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's join together now in singing hymn number 353, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Hymn number 353. <laughs>
please pray with me? Our dear Heavenly Father, what can we possibly offer to you that you haven't already made available to us? When we pray, you answer. When we draw near, you are there. When we abide in your word and obey your commandments, we receive the abundant life that you give so freely. Our cups overflow with joy. Today, Lord, we make this prayer of praise and thanksgiving for all you have done, the things you are doing and the things that are to come. You know each of us, Lord, and we are appreciative. You have blessed those who give much and those who have little to give, just as you provide rain and sunshine for the just and the unjust, so that all may know your unconditional love. You have taught us it is more blessed to give than receive because you sent yourself through your only son to give us eternal life. We can't outgive you, Lord, but we can surrender our all, our lives to your will. That is all you ask. Bless now the tangible gifts and the gifts from the heart, which are returned in gratitude. With these gifts, we glorify you in our minds, our bodies, and spirits which you have made available to us by your grace. Amen. The Old Testament scripture reading for the day is Psalm 92, verses 12 through 15. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. In old age, they still produce fruit. They are always green and full of sap, showing that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. These are the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
We the church throughout the nations all unite this holy day to acknowledge Christ our Savior and to call on his great name. Now believing and agreeing in the power of the cross, millions joining from every corner, bound together by his And God's children said, Amen. As you read the New Testament, you quickly become aware that the Apostle Paul is a very important person. Perhaps, arguably, the second most important person in the New Testament. The theologians and biblical scholars debate his authorship of all 13 letters that span between Acts and Hebrews. But nevertheless, Paul is one who wrote several of those letters, and he is one who cast a very long shadow over the early church and continues to influence the church today. I am sure you have read the letters of Paul and read excerpts of those. We include them in our worship services quite often. 
And I wonder if you have a favorite of Paul's letters. Now, choosing a favorite of Paul's letters depends quite often on where you are in life and what it is that you're needing and what you're thinking about. If, for example, you want a letter of great encouragement and positive attitude, even in the midst of very difficult circumstances, you can do no better than choosing to read the letter to the Philippian church. Paul is so upbeat and positive about the glory of being a Christian and, and the sufficiency of God's grace to see him through the, even the worst of circumstances. It's a beautiful letter. If, however, you want a, a, a reading to understand how we are saved by grace rather than the law, then you need to read his letter to the church in Galatia. Galatians is a magnificent testimony of the power of grace and that we are saved by God's mercy and not by the things that we do. If you want a, a passage of scripture or a, a letter to help you appreciate the church and appreciate where we are, then, then read Corinthians. For as you read Corinthians, you will see that there are churches at times that are in much worse shape than churches are today. If you want a passage of scripture that will tell you something about the importance of unity, not only within the church, but within the family, then read Ephesians. Ephesians is a passage where, where Paul speaks about how important it is for us to be united in our, our devotion to Jesus Christ. We may not always think the same way. We may not always believe exactly the same, but it is so important, Paul says in Ephesians, that we be united in our love for and devotion to Jesus Christ. And finally, if you want a passage of scripture, if you want a, a theological statement, then read Romans. Romans is a masterpiece of theology. It is, it is Paul's theological treatise, if you will, in which he describes who Jesus is and how Jesus comes and loves us and extends God's mercy to us. Now, I will warn you, if you want to read Romans, you need to mark out some time on your calendar. You can read it in about an hour. But if you want to understand Romans, that will take you the rest of your life. Romans is a very complicated passage of Scripture as it is presented, but yet it is brilliant and it will take you all of your life to fully understand what Paul was saying to the church in Rome and to us. If you don't want to give it all of your life, then what you could do is read the eighth chapter of Romans. That won't take you that long. And yet it summarizes in good form the, the truth of the love that we have in Christ. And if you don't want to read the entire chapter, then you couldn't do any worse than reading verses 38 and 39 of Romans. Because in Romans 38 and 39, when Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, he does a magnificent work of summarizing the entire message of Scripture. Not just the message that he writes in all of his letters and not just the message of the New Testament. Paul summarizes beautifully the entire word of Scripture to us in telling us that the love of God is the greatest reality that there is. And that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. Not angels, not demons, not the past, nor the present, not life, nor death. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ, Paul says. And I especially like, as he reaches the end of his list, of going through all these different things that cannot separate us from the love of God, Paul says, nor anything else. I am so thankful that Paul remembered to say, nor anything else, because you can pack a lot into anything, can't you? you? You can pack a lot into anything else. Talking back to your dad, fudging on your taxes just a little bit, muttering an unkind, unchristian word to that person who cuts you off in traffic making change out of the offering plate, all of those things can be covered under anything else. 
And today, I am adding one more word to anything else. I am adding age. For I am convinced that age cannot separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Now you know that. You saw that exemplified from this sanctuary just last week. As we gathered together and our young people stood here at this pulpit and preached and sang and shared with us the love of God and Christ that is within them. They gave a marvelous, embodied, a marvelous testimony of the fact that they believe that God loves them and that God is using them to share love with other people. And today, as we mark Senior Adult Day, we are proving the same point only from the other end of the age spectrum. For our senior adults, our more mature adults are coming today to say that just as our youth said that God loves them and is using them as they begin to live into their story, we believe that God loves us and is using us as we enter and live the latter half of our stories. The truth is that age, among everything else, cannot separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. And not only do our senior adults say that today, but Paul proves that. Paul, in writing this letter, we're going to have to take a little bit of liberty with uh, our historical knowledge to make this point, but it is very difficult for us to pin down exactly when Paul was born, but historians tell us that perhaps it was around the year 5 CE. It's also difficult for us to know with certainty exactly when Paul wrote Romans, but we believe it was sometime around the year 55 to 60 CE. Do the math, you realize that Paul probably wrote this letter at about the age of 50. Now, I'm sure none of us here would say that 50 is old, right? 50 is not old. I think that deserves an amen. Amen? 50 is not old, nor is 49. 50 is not old, but when we remember the fact that the average lifespan in Paul's day was 30, we realize that Paul is in the latter half of his life. Paul is one of the old guys. Paul is one who would have participated in senior adult day. He's one of the old guys, but yet God uses him to speak, to write this profound, brilliantly true word that he writes to the Romans. And he does that because the truth of the fact about God is he never consults a birth certificate when he is calling someone to do something. And Paul is not the only one. Think of so many others in Scripture that God uses irregardless of their age. Think of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham, who was 100, and Sarah, who was 90, when they became the parents of Isaac and thus became a father and mother of nations. Think of Moses, who Moses, who at 80 is out minding his own business as a shepherd, that God calls him through the burning bush and sends him back to Egypt to win the release of his Israelite children. And think of Caleb some 40 years later, who at the ripe young age of 85 looks to Joshua and demands the opportunity and the the right to lead his tribe of Judah into their portion of the promised land. There's Abraham and Sarah, there's Moses, there's Caleb, and there are many others within Scripture and certainly within the history of the church who knew that God could bless their families and that God could bless the people that they lived around irregardless of their age regardless of how many candles were on their birthday cake, they believed, they believed that God was working in their life, that God had called them to something important, that God was using them in a very powerful way. You see, these and so many others believed that when you are connected to the living God, then anything is possible. 
When you are connected to the source of life, the God who spoke this world into being, then anything can happen through you regardless of who you are, where you've been, what you've done, or how long it's been since you've done it. When you are connected to God, All things are made new. When you are connected to God, you are facing endless possibilities. Now, I'm using the word connected, and that's a fine word, but it pales in comparison to the word and the image that the psalmist gives us. The psalmist uses a much better word than connected. You heard this passage just a moment ago as the psalmist draws a, a picture for us. He says the righteous, the the righteous, regardless of how old they are, they are like a palm tree that has been planted in the courts of the temple. They are a a palm tree that has been growing there in in the courts of the temple. And regardless of how old they are, they continue to bear fruit. They are strong. They are mighty. They are growing. They are connected to the very source of life. Now, the psalmist is not talking about trees. He is talking about people. He is talking about people who continue to abide, who continue to take up residence, who continue to remain in the presence and in relationship with God. He is talking about people who have spent their whole life, not just in the church, but in a relationship with God so that no matter how old they get, They are always producing fruit. They're always sharing love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. All those fruits of the Spirit, it's always coming out of them. I love how the psalmist says it in, in, in the verse. He says, in old age, the righteous, they still produce fruit. They are green and full of sap. Showing that the Lord is upright. Green and full of sap. Now, how do you like that for a descriptor of the senior adult years? I asked the thesaurus this week to give me a few words for senior adult. And there were some very common words like elderly and geriatric and golden ager. And then there were some other words that I didn't think were very flattering. Like old fogey. And over the hill, and time worn, and worse for the wear. Words that we would never say. We don't have time worn adults in our church. We don't have any old fogies. But we have lots of venerable adults in our church. That was the most dignified sounding word that I saw. Venerable adults. That's a good word. We can aspire to be venerable adults at First Baptist. But still, I want to know, what do you think of the term green and full of sap? Now, I'm not a senior adult, but I like that term. I like that idea. I like the idea it gives of regardless of your age, that you are always producing those fruit of the Spirit. You're always growing. You're always sharing something. You're you're as green and full of sap. You are always learning something new each day. When you read the Scripture, when you're in conversation with someone, you approach each conversation and each opportunity as an opportunity to learn something new. I like the idea that even though our bodies may age and slow down, that our spirits can always be made new and fresh and in a way that can be of benefit to others. I love the idea of God calling us, calling us at a young age and giving us a ministry to do and our staying with that task throughout all of our lives. That's what it means to be green and full of sap, to hear God calling you and to continue to answer that call each and every day. Now, you might have thought that Ms. Vivian would be one who could perhaps retire from her calling, 
But she was convinced that God had called her as a young lady and she was not about to retire from that call. A preacher friend of mine told me about Ms. Vivian just a few weeks ago. He was a student at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And this was at the very beginning of his career, and he has just recently retired, so it's been quite a few years ago. But he, tell, he told me about Ms. Vivian, who at 80-some years old was teaching the four- and five-year-old children every Sunday in Sunday school. And she had been doing this for as long as anyone could remember. Everyone in the church had been taught four- and five-year-old Sunday school by Ms. Vivian. She loved the church, and she was absolutely convinced that God had called her to that ministry, and she was going to continue to teach and continue to be there for those children every Sunday that she was physically able to do so. Well, at Broadway Baptist Church, back in the 60s, things began to change. In fact, the whole community began to change. A family of color moved into the neighborhood, and then another family did. And with that, white flight was on. Louisville experienced the, the, the agony of that type of life, as bad as any town in the country. And, and before long, all the folks who were going to Broadway Baptist Church, they were starting to move out to the suburbs. And when they moved out to the suburbs, they quit coming downtown to Broadway Baptist Church. But Ms. Vivian stayed right there. She loved her house. She loved her life. She loved her community. And she loved her church. And she loved teaching four- and five-year-olds in Sunday school. So she continued to show up every Sunday. But with every Sunday, the, the crowd of children got smaller and smaller and smaller. And so one Sunday, no children were there. And she got upset about that, of course. And, and about that time, her son, who had lived close by, but who had moved out to the suburbs, he started insisting that she come out and live with him. No, I like it right here, she said. This is my house, this is my community, and this is my church, and this is where I'm going to stay. But he kept asking and then finally insisting. And so finally she said, okay. I'll move out there under one condition. I will move out there as long as I can come back to my church every Sunday. Mom will make that happen, he said. And so on the following Sunday, Ms. Vivian gets up bright and early, and she gets on a bus and rides the bus from the suburbs where her son lived all the way back into town to Broadway Baptist Church. And she gets there, and there might have been one or two children there, and she teaches them, and everything's fine. And she keeps that up for a few weeks, but after a while, no children are there. But still, being green and full of sap, Ms. Vivian, she is determined that God has called her to this ministry, and she's going to continue this ministry as long as she can. So the next week, she gets on an earlier bus, rides all the way downtown, She's there at the crack of dawn. And instead of going right in and preparing her room and doing all the things that she needed to do, she started walking through the neighborhood and knocking on every door. This lady is 80 years old. And she's going to every house and she's knocking on the door. And regardless of who answered the door, if there was a four or a five-year-old in that house, they were invited. They were compelled to come to Sunday school. It didn't matter who they were. It didn't matter the color of their skin. It didn't matter if they'd ever been in church before. It didn't matter. She brought them to Sunday school. She led a little parade through the neighborhood around the church and brought them into her classroom. And then when it came time for worship, she had those children sitting on the third row from the front, a half dozen children just as well-mannered and polite and respectful as you can possibly imagine because Miss Vivian was sitting right there with them. At 80 years old, God called me to this ministry. And so she continued it to her dying day. Now, I didn't ask my preacher friend if he had asked Miss Vivian about the secret. 
because I was amazed at her story. How is it that an 80-year-old lady can get up each day and prepare a Sunday school lesson and get up on Sunday morning and take the first bus into town and then walk the neighborhood and gather in all of the children and bring them in and teach the lesson and then take them to worship and then get them back home. The scripture says that the righteous are old or green and full of sap, but I think Ms. Vivian had more sap in her than, than people half her age. And I'd love to know what was her secret. And I don't know that my friend asked her, but the folks like Ms. Vivian that I have met, they usually tell me that there really is no secret. Because the secret is right there in the psalm. The secret to always producing fruit and living a vivacious, alive life with God, it's all in the planting. It's in where you plant yourself. You, you can plant yourself out in the community. You can plant yourself out in all kinds of places. But if you'll plant yourself in a relationship with the living God, then God will nourish and feed you all the days of your life. And to your dying day, you will grow good fruit. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you that you are a creative, loving, life-giving God who always seeks to teach us something new each day, to give us dreams and hopes, and then to give us the energy and the wisdom to see those dreams and hopes that are from you come to life. I thank you, Lord, for the Abraham and Sarahs, for the Moseses, for the Calebs, for the Pauls, and I thank you, Lord, for the Vivians, green and full of sap. Really, Lord, just full of the love of Jesus Christ, a love so compelling that it must be shared. It's in your son's name I pray, amen. Our hymn of response is number 372. If you would respond to God's grace today, then I invite you to come. Let's stand together and sing, I Then Shall Live.
the righteous are like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. I pray that as you have been in this place today, that you have received the nourishment and the grace that you need for another day, another week of serving Christ in your families and in your workplaces and in our community. As you go from this place today, I encourage you to keep a couple of families in your prayers within our church family. Just yesterday, we lost a very dear man of faith, Mr. Charles Owens. Charles passed away yesterday morning. We do not at this time know the arrangements for his funeral service, but we are anticipating that to be sometime this week. But I would ask that you remember Francis and their sons, Barry and Russell, uh, in your prayers over these next several days. And then also, if you would remember Mr. John Barker. John is to undergo a, a very serious surgery on Tuesday, and we've been asked to remember John in our prayers as well. And pray for one another. Pray that we would all have the strength to be who God has called us to be and to share the love and mercy of Christ. As we conclude our worship service today, the Joyful Notes is going to share our benediction in song. <laughs> 